all space <clears throat> will be public space. Is this an exaggeration? Yes, of course it is. But so is saying that the cost of computing and communications are zero. However, they are so close and getting closer so fast that for large design and policy questions, it's more helpful to just assume that computing and communications cost zero. I claim the same here. For thinking about big social design and policy questions, in the future, we should simply assume that all space will be public space. CCTV is becoming ubiquitous. High resolution satellites and Google Street View show you my patio and my front yard. News reporting is instant. The cycle is 24 by 7. Blogging has unleashed thousands of microtopic investigative journalists. And everyone carries a high definition still and video camera in their pocket, which we used to call a cell phone always connected with instant publishing to the internet. These are technologies that make private life public, whether we like it or not. But the big surprise is the social media revolution. The social media technologies enable the explosion in social networking behavior. With these te technologies, we are volunteering to live our lives out in public. In 1999, Josh Harris wired his apartment with about 30 cameras that broadcasts his life with his girlfriend. His whole life, eating, sleeping, defecating, making love. Within a few years, reality shows dominate broadcast TV. And now we write our own reality shows, announcing when we break up with a boyfriend on Facebook, or sharing last night's party fun on a photo site. Perhaps you like to tweet your bladder status. Or you like to announce your current location to the world with Foursquare or Gowalla or Facebook or Google. On Doppler and TripIt, people publish their travel plans. Is social networking important? Or is it just the latest hype? Clear evidence that it's having a profound effect on our culture is the proliferation of new words and meanings in the past decade. If Facebook were a country, it would be the third largest in the world. Today, 30% of couples meet online. In 2009, one in eight marriages started online. Twitter averages 40 million tweets per day. People upload 5,500 5, photos a minute to Flickr. How fast is it growing? One way to think about that is to look at how long it has taken various information technologies to get their first 50 million users. It took radio 38 years to get 50 million users. It took television 13 years. It took the iPod three years. Facebook, however, obtained 200 million users in less than one year. Are today's social media the future of technology? No. Today's social media technologies are already in their senescence. Yet the social networking that they bring us is written into our cultural DNA. This is my story. Tomorrow's social technology is written for us by today's living private in public. Today's social media are dying. How can I claim that? The short answer, our information technology tools are being remade every 10 to 20 years, and we generally suck at predicting the next revolution. Before Carter Phone overcame AT&T in court in 1968, only AT&T could make phones to attach to the network. At that time, few people foresaw that everyone would have an iPhone or an Android in their pocket. At the dawn of the PC age in 1976, or so, most of us could not foresee the web. Yes, we know that Vannevar Bush did, but in a vague, unheralded way that is mostly recognized in hindsight. At the dawn of the web age in about 1994, for those of you who remember Mosaic, most of us could not see social media or networking. 
Plenty of folks are happy to guess about the next best thing, sorry, the next big thing. They'll mostly be wrong. But we do know that each information and communication technology revolution has had a finite life. The phone. The phone now is just another app on our handheld devices, and it's becoming a much less important one. The desktop PC is dying, replaced by laptops and thin clients. Laptops are dying, replaced by cell phones and iPads. Wired Magazine recently pointed out that the web itself is dead, accounting for only 23% of internet traffic today and increasingly replaced by separate apps instead of browsers. So yes, very soon, what we think of today as social media will be dead. By the end of 2008, teen use of email had dropped from 89% to 73%, with much more reliance on text messaging. And now more teens engage in online social gaming than in using social websites. But all of my friends are using Facebook. Sorry, this won't be the first time that adults are behind the kids. Think back to 1999. Everyone was on AOL then, or used AIM instant messaging. Remember AOL? Yes, yeah, social media as we know it today will soon be in the death throes, like each of these other technologies. But each has had a direct long-term impact on culture, and thus prepared the ground for the next revolution. Social networking is written into our cultural DNA. It is the future today. All space will be public space. Why is social networking making all space public space? Dana Boyd identifies four features that distinguish networked publics. The information we share is persistent. What we share today, all else equal, will be available tomorrow and next decade. Searchability. It is often easy to find our digital traces. For example, I searched Google for digital traces of our gracious host, Dean Ponce de Leon. Replicability. What we inscribe in one space need not stay there. We have high fidelity copy and paste. The forwarded email, the blog entries about college indiscretions, these can reappear anywhere. And invisible audiences, the FOF phenomenon, friend of a friend. Yes, you may trust your 500 closest friends on Facebook with your intimacies, but what about each of their 500 friends and their friends' friends? We're each less than six degrees of connection away from Kevin Bacon, not to mention Perez Hilton or TMZ and Rupert Murdoch's Fox News. So what does it mean to be living in public? What does it mean for all spaces to be public spaces? Surely this will affect the way in which we design and understand public space in the future. Let me give you an example. Well, that's silly, you say. Sure, there are a few weirdos, but most people won't be having real-time sex in a networked public. Not so silly. All spaces will be public spaces. Certainly, we know that it's no longer uncommon for people to publicly, to publicly post words and pictures and videos of their sexual activity after they're done. How big a leap is it for them to stay online while having sex? In this 2010 survey, 10% of people under 25 responded that it's perfectly okay to text while having sex. <laughs> and this finding's not an anomaly. A 2008 Osterman research survey found that 11% of adults have used their, mobile phone, phone, sorry, used their mobile phones during intimate behavior. A 2010 Harris Interactive study found that 24% of US residents think it is fine to be plugged into the internet during sex. To live our lives in public, we need to evolve new social norms. A recent hot topic on Twitter. When a couple breaks up, who should announce it first on Facebook, the dumper or the dumpy? <laughs> there are dozens of sites where you can share your breakup stories, thebreakupsurvivor.com, youbrokeuphow.com, breakinginfo.com, brokenheartsclub.com, and so forth. The public breakup can go horribly wrong.
This woman changed her public Facebook status from married to single four days after she separated from her husband. He flipped out. Of course, the implications of living in public are not all scary. Some are quite exciting. For example, we are moving from a society with near universal literacy to one with near universal authorship. Everyone in public is performing. Everyone creates. And the nature of networked publics is that our inscriptions persist. Universal authorship can play a fabulous role in education and learning. But other than people writing words and leaving them in public, what else does it mean to create and perform everything in public? We scholars and teachers have been learning to live with our drafts and our informal work, such as lecture slides, being shared and scrutinized. But that's just a small increment on what we already do. What else are we authoring in public? Our diaries, from the mundane to the intimate, from getting our morning Starbucks to that great feeling of an empty bladder. We have personal conversations with our friends in public, in MySpace and Facebook. We report the details of our exercise, whether it's our pedometer count on walkertracker.com or our running on dailymile.com. And if that doesn't seem too intimate, we share our health conditions and our treatments. Here are a few of the 474 people who are bipolar one who report their symptoms, treatments, and outcomes on the public site patients like me. With a Zeo sleep monitor, we can record and share on the internet our brain's sleep patterns. With a Fitbit or a Proteus, we can monitor and share our heart rate, calorie burn rates, and body position. And of course, our universal authorship extends to writing the self. We create new personae. We fluidly engage in gender bending, location bending, even species bending. When all spaces are public spaces, we need to learn new ways to communicate. For surely, we sometimes will want to maintain some privacy, even as our notions of self and private change. What is the future of the technology of whispering? We've known for a while now that young people often lie to preserve their privacy in public spaces. Indeed, they are even encouraged by their parents to use false names, ages, locations. And youth are engaging in steganography, hiding communication in plain sight. They are learning to speak in layers, sharing intimacies with friends while knowing that their parents are listening. We see a rapid proliferation of new vernaculars and slang, and extensive use of generation-specific cultural references as metaphors. Learning to navigate universal authorship, inscribing our multiple personae in public spaces, speaking in tongues, this creates new challenges. Consider this passage from Dana Boyd's thesis. The magnified public exposure increases the stakes. Consider a call that I received from an admissions officer at a prestigious college. The admissions committee had planned to admit a young black man from a very poor urban community until they found his MySpace. They were horrified to find that his profile was full of hip hop imagery, urban ghetto slang, and hints of gang participation. This completely contradicted the essay they had received from him about the problems with gangs in his community, and they were at a loss. Did he lie in his application? I offered the admissions officer an alternative explanation. Perhaps he needed to acquiesce to the norms of the gangs while living in his neighborhood in order to survive and make it through high school. I will wrap up now. I don't know what future social media technologies will be like. But today's social media technologies are writing on our cultural DNA, and the result is that we will be living our lives in public. All spaces will be public spaces. And this fact matters for the future technologies we do develop. We will want them to enable public living. We will also want them to provide affordances for protecting ourselves from dangers of living in public. We will want technologies that help us solve a core paradox of the 21st century. Can we create safe spaces inside public spaces? Thank you.